Hi everybody, in this week's episode of Gaffer and Gear, it is a gear review by request. We're looking at the Nunlight Mixpixel 150. This light boasts two CCT modes. It has a soft light mode that goes from 2,700 Kelvin all the way up to 7,500 Kelvin with roughly about a 170 degree flood angle. The other CCT mode is a high intensity spot mode. Again, 2,700 Kelvin all the way up to 7,500 Kelvin. It is also full RGB capable. Now we're gonna be also comparing this unit to the Luxley Timpani, which is roughly about the same price and similar capabilities. And in terms of the immense firepower you get out of this thing in its spot mode, we're gonna compare it to an RE Sky Panel. All right, so let's start with a very, very quick overview before I get into the things I don't like about this panel. Okay, so um, in terms of its build quality, it is um, very well built. It's very strong, it's elegant. Um, you know, the buttons, the controls uh, are top quality. Even the uh, input connectors, uh, very, very good. You know, you know professional grade, um, you know, top-end professional grade quality in terms of its, its build and its elegance. So let's chuck a battery on and have a look. Um, we'll get into one thing I really uh, don't like with uh, panel lights, and if you watch enough of my videos, you know what I'm going to talk about. Um, panel lights, barn doors are pretty much useless. Um, the only thing that barn doors are really good for is, say, putting some diffusion on to, to make the light source bigger, to make it softer. Apart from that, barn doors, you know, they, they really are useless. They don't help you, uh, help you shape the light at all. So we'll just have a look at that. So let's try and box this up. And as you see, the barn doors don't really they don't really do anything at all. They're pretty much useless. Um, so that's that's uh, my opinion on barn doors on on pretty much panel lights. They, d they don't seem to be to be any good. Now this is your uh, typical um, Nanguan barn door design that they've had for for decades now. However, they have done a huge improvement here. It unclips, so I can get it out of the way now. So I don't need those barn doors anymore, and that gives me um, a very very slim profile light you know, that I can use in tight spaces. Now the big point of difference between this and other panels is this is actually two lights built into one, which has been a bit of a nightmare for me because I've had to do twice the amount of testing for this video. Okay, so at the moment it's set up in the hard light mode. So it's, it's similar to a lot of other lights that you can buy at the moment. So basically you've got your daylight and tungsten emitters and they're underneath a magnifying glass or underneath a lens. The other um, lenses that are not lit up, that's your RGB array. So each lens that's not illuminated at the moment has its red, green and blue emitter underneath the one lens. Okay, so these uh, lenses or, or, or magnifying glasses basically concentrate the beam down. So it compresses the beam, basically makes it a spot. So it gives you a humongous amount of light, but you don't get much, uh, much flood out of this. So let's just have a quick look through. I reckon it's about a, um, a 30 degree beam. So quite a lot of intensity, but not much flood. All right, so now let's have a look at the, uh, the second light uh, that's built into these, because I said it's two lights built into one. So uh, around the outside of the unit um, is uh, an, a second LED array, bicolor LED array, which edge lights this front perspex. So this front perspex has a whole stack of white dots on it. And when it is edge lit, those small white dots, there's probably thousands of them there, those small white dots then illuminate and give you a soft light source. So let's just have a look. So this is the hard light source. And now I'm going to flick it to soft light. Okay, so that's your soft light source there. So I'm just gonna bring that up to about 10%. And you can see that that is now a very soft, uh, very soft panel light. Now where this is, is uh, hugely usable, or, or I think very, very clever, is if I had this in hard light mode and I had it pointing towards me, um, I would need to put some diffusion over the barn doors, okay, to get it this soft, because I'd be getting all the shadows off the individual hard lights. Whereas uh, if I don't have the space to do that, if I don't have the space to have barn doors out, if I'm in a small environment, this is actually quite clever. So as you can see here, I've got a very, very soft light source, uh, singular light source, not many multiple shadowing, or not any multiple shadowing. So it's a very, very clever concept. 
All right, so let's get into the negatives, and I only really have two. And depending on your point of view, they may or may not be negatives at all. Now, the first one I think is gonna be a big negative for a lot of people who are looking to buy this. Now, if you're gonna buy this, you're probably hoping to run it off V-Lock batteries. So let's chuck on a 14.8 volt V-Lock battery and see what happens. Okay, so everything's firing up, looks good. And then you get this message telling you that the uh, Mix Pixel 150 can only be powered by a 26 volt battery. So for a lot of you, that's gonna be a major bummer. So if you're gonna run this light off V-Lock batteries, you're gonna have to buy 26 volt. Now the next negative for this light probably only affects you if you're gonna try and use it with other top end lights, like say the Sky Panel here or the Luxly. And that is that this thing in CCT mode doesn't use RGB to help it vector into its white points. It basically works as a bicolor light. So if you have a look at the graphic here, that curved line is what the human eye perceives as being white. The problem with having a bicolor light is you've got one white point, another white point, and as you adjust your Kelvin, it tracks linear. It goes underneath that line. Now, underneath that line is pink. So how pink is it? Well, if you're at 3,200 Kelvin or 5,600 Kelvin, you're gonna be approximately a one quarter correction gel out. Now the unit does have plus minus green capability. The CCT, your color temperature, is selected by using your white color emitters. And your plus minus green is using the uh, RGB emitters just basically slapped on top. So you've got your white emitters, you've got your RGB emitters, and they don't properly link together in this mode. So I'm just gonna show you what I'm talking about. So let's fire this thing up. And let's add a little bit of uh, minus green. Okay, so I'm adding just a little bit of minus green, adding some pink to the light. Now, when I fade the light down, watch what happens to the colors. Okay, the white color emitters fade, but the RGB color emitters stay the same intensity. So basically the more I fade, the pinker the light gets. That's the negatives out of the way. Let's get into what I think is this light's biggest positive. And it's not the fact that it has a hard light and a soft light mode. It's the brightness. This would have to be one of the brightest portable panels that you can run off a single battery. So before I get into talking about the brightness, I need to talk about the modes of operation that it has. So if you go to menu, and you select light mode, you've got a choice of three modes. You've got silent mode, where the fans don't run. The next mode is normal mode, which gives you more intensity, but the cooling fans turn on. Now, the cooling fans do worry me a little bit. You know, I figure if I was doing a corporate interview and I had three of these units in the room, the sound recorders would complain about the cooling fans. But before you worry about that, I reckon this thing is plenty bright enough in silent mode. Okay, now the next mode down, so let's have a look, is boost mode. So this mode runs the light at full power and turns the fans up. This is a crazy amount of light. Okay, so just how bright is this unit? Okay, so let's go back to silent mode and have a look. Now, all of these measurements are my measurements and they're done here in the workshop at three meters. Now at three meters, at 3,200 Kelvin, this unit was spitting out 914 lux in silent mode. Okay, putting it into normal mode, that boosted to 1,310 lux. Now when I put it into boost mode, that gave me a staggering 1,720 lux. That is a crazy amount of light to get out of a small panel. Now to put that into some sort of perspective, if we put this thing into silent mode and we compared it to the timpani, the timpani comes in at 414 lux at 3200 Kelvin at 100% brightness at three meters. So that makes this light in silent mode 120% brighter than the timpani. That's in silent mode. If you put it into normal mode, it is three times brighter. And if you put it into boost mode, it is four times brighter than the timpani. That is a staggering amount of brightness. Now to put that into some, um, some comparison for you, if you're not used to a timpani, 
let's compare it to an Ari Sky panel. Now in silent mode, this thing is 20% brighter than an Ari Sky panel in silent mode. Now if we put it into the normal mode, it is 74% brighter than the Ari Sky Panel S30. Now, if we put it into the boost mode, it is 129% brighter than the Ari Sky Panel. All right, so before we get too carried away with the brightness, I just need to point something out. And that is um, all of those levels I just gave you is with this thing running in hard light mode, which is a very, very compacted beam. Now, as soon as you flood this out, put it into soft mode, you are down to one fifth the brightness. Okay, so that's something to point out here. So in its um, soft light mode, the, um, the measurements at three meters. Now in silent mode, it is 173 lux. In its normal mode, it is 248 lux. And in its boost mode, it comes in at 314 lux. So something here I just want to point out. So this thing in its flood mode is um, in its soft mode has pretty much a similar beam angle to the RE Sky panel. But the difference is the RE Sky panel is now 240% brighter than this. Okay, so that is something worth pointing out. This thing is incredibly powerful in its hard light mode because it's spotted, but in its flood light mode, it is not the most powerful light on the planet. All right, now let's do a run through and see what this, uh, this unit can do. So when you turn it on, it does take a little bit of time to boot. It's got to load its software. No big deal there. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the uh, preset, which is how you save and recall things. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the preset first because that is something that works in all of the, uh, all of the light modes. All right, so let's say we want to save the setting that we've got on screen now. Basically, you just hold the preset button down and up comes a screen where you can now type in what you want to save it as. Now, when I first saw this, I thought this is going to be a pain because it's not a touch screen, but um, the absolute positive feel of the controls uh, makes it very, very easy uh, to type something in. I was actually quite surprised. So uh, every, uh, every time you twist this, there's a notch and every notch movement is a letter. So it really is superb control over the display. So let's just go cancel for the moment and go back to our CCT mode. If I want to recall something, you just press the uh, preset and then select the one that you want and it's, it really is that simple. Okay, let's have a look at the CCT mode first. CCT mode is very straightforward. If you want to change between the soft light mode and the hard light mode, you just press the CCT button. So it really is that straightforward. Okay, the first knob controls your brightness and that dims in 1%. Now, uh, if you want to... Um, so basically, let's say we want to have this as a setting that we want the light to fire up to. If I press the button, it'll toggle down to zero. And then if I press the button again or press the knob again, it'll go back to what my last setting was. So I accidentally slipped there. So let's go 28 on and off to 28. Now the center knob controls our CCT. Now uh, it's got a huge CCT range on it. Okay, 2700 Kelvin. Uh, all the way up to um, 7,500 Kelvin in 100 Kelvin increments. Now, with this knob, if you press it, it'll scroll around presets. So it's very easy to, to just get to your common colors. And the last knob is your plus minus green. And if you press this, it'll default to zero plus minus green. Now, the next mode we'll have a look at is HSI, which is hue, saturation, and intensity. It's basically your primary RGB mode. Now to select your modes on this, you literally just press the button on the back. Now you know what mode you're in because the button is now backlit with a blue light. Now the HSI mode on this is really simple to operate. So uh, the one knob controls your brightness, 1% increments. The center knob controls the, uh, your hue angle, what color you're selecting from your color wheel. Now, unlike uh, a lot of lights in this price point, uh, this actually is calibrated. So the number that appears is the, the legit angle on the color wheel, and you've got all 360 colors. Um, so that's fantastic. Now, the other difference between this is when you desaturate, which is uh, what the uh, last knob does. Let's, let's pick a nice color. Let's go, Ooh, let's go a purple. Okay, when you desaturate, which is what the last knob does, this thing actually desaturates to its white color emitters and it desaturates to a 5,500 Kelvin color point. So let's have a look at that. So that's the HSI mode. 
pretty damn good for the price. Now, before we have a look at the next mode, there is something I should point out with this unit that I think is absolute genius. And that is, if you are working in the dark, you can actually see what you are doing. All of the buttons are illuminated. You've got enough light coming off these buttons that you can see the knobs and the display is bright and clear. Okay, so let's get into the next mode, which is RGBW. Uh, so basically in this mode, you can select the values of the individual channels. So your select uh, roller here um, chooses what you are selecting to change, and then your center knob changes the values on that channel. The next feature we'll have a look at is the gels library. And if you don't handle disappointment, well, just skip this section of the video. In this mode, you can select whether you're a 3200 base or a 5600 Kelvin base. The uh, end knob uh, allows you to select the gel. So it allows you to scroll through the gels library. And it's gonna take you a massive 10 seconds to scroll through all the gels that are here. There's no Lee or Roscoe branded gels. There's just CTOs, CTBs, and some colors. So um, quite literally, that was the entire gels library. Now let's have a look at the effects library. And uh, what I'm gonna say about this is with the exception of the RE sky panel, I can't think of another light that has as good an effects library as this. Um, uh, well, not just the fact that it's got an effects library, but the amount of control you've got over the effects. So we'll just have a look at this first one. So this is um, a hue loop. So basically it's like a color chase. Now I can select my start hue, I can select my end hue, I can select the saturation of, of the colors, I can select the speed, I can select whether it's going in a loop or whether it's going one way and then the other. Now I can also select add-ons, so I can, um, let's have a look here, I can go flashing, so I can flash through the color cycle. I can pulse through the color cycle. It's, it's just fantastic the amount of control that you've got over your effects. So let's scroll through some of the effects here. We've got CCT loop, uh, we've got flash, and look at, the, um, look at the options on the flash. I can select CCT or HSI, um, you know, my, my color temperature plus minus green. In HSI, I can select the, the color, I can select the saturation duration, um, it, it's just fantastic what I can, what I can choose here. Pulse, um, lots of options on that. Storm, okay. Police car, police car's not too bad. I, I sort of like the, the, the duration of the pulses. Uh, TV, uh, let's get to something really complex. Let's have a look at the fire candle. So I'll just turn the other lights off in the, uh, in the room here and have a look at how you know, believable this fire effect is. The next thing we'll have a look at is the DMX capability of this thing. And I've got to say, for a light that costs around the 1000 US dollar mark, I really am surprised at the DMX capability. So to get into your DMX, you press uh, the menu button, scroll down to DMX and uh, press select. Now you've got channel and DMX mode. We're not gonna bother with channel because that's pretty straightforward. Your DMX mode, you've got a choice of two modes. Mode one is like a, an ultimate mode. It enables you to, to operate everything okay and mode two is a very sort of basic uh, seven channel mode so you've got uh, each of your color channels warm white cool white rgb you've got another channel to select hard soft and the last channel is your cooling fans so that's the sort of uh, crappy dmx profile i was expecting this to have but we'll have a look at uh, at mode one now uh, when you have a look through the instruction manual it really looks daunting, this mode. It's just three pages of, of instructions. It's totally daunting. So what I would suggest you do is once you get it into DMX mode, and uh, just by the way, DMX is hardwired. There's no lumen radio. Um, you wouldn't expect a lumen radio at this price point. Uh, basically, get out of your menu system and go to the home page. Now, whatever you do on your controller, on your DMX controller, comes up on the home page. So if you use your DMX controller, Next to the home, uh, home screen here, next to the, the screen on the back, it really helps make a lot of sense out of this. So I'm gonna fade everything to black in the room and then start playing with this. So channel one is always your brightness, okay? Regardless of what mode you're in, 
Channel one is always your brightness. Channel two selects what mode you're in. So at the moment we're in CCT mode. Okay, I keep scrolling up, we go to HSI mode. I keep scrolling channel two up, RGB, okay, gels mode and effects mode. So channel two selects what mode you're in. Okay, so let's go back to CCT. All right, so whatever the first option is in the mode you've selected, that's the next slider, that's channel three. So channel three here is going to be our CCT. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Channel four is going to be the next option, which is plus minus green. Now, one thing I've got to say I don't like about um, the DMX on this is in my opinion, plus minus green, zero should always be, um, sorry, I'm just going to go right-handed because I'm, uh, there we go. Zero, which I'm trying to get to. That's why I hate touch screens. There we go. Zero shouldn't be halfway up the dial. Zero should be at the bottom. I reckon on plus minus green, zero should be off. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go to the next uh, menu. So let's scroll up on channel two, which is our selector. HSI mode. Okay, so channel three, that'll be the next selection across, which is hue. Okay, so let's have a look. So that changes our hue. Of course, the color's not changing because we haven't selected our saturation, which must be channel four. Okay. So how easy is that to navigate? It's very, very easy to navigate through this menu. Okay, so let's turn those channels down. Let's select the next thing on channel two. Uh, RGB, we'll give that a miss, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, gels library. Okay, so the next option across is on the screen here is your Kelvin, so that'll be channel three. Okay, so there we go, 5600 or 3200. And then the next option you can select is your gel type, so that must be channel four. So as you can see, very, very easy to control over DMX. Okay, let's get a little bit more complicated. Let's go into the effects library. Okay, now let's select our effect. So that's the first choice we've got. So that must be the next slider. So the next slider effects selects our effect. Let's go cop car. Now our next choice is uh, the color. So that must be the next slider on the DMX. Okay, so. Red and blue, okay, uh, blue and white. I like red and blue, let's go red and blue. Now, the next thing we can choose on the back of the display is uh, how many times it pulses. So that must be the next slider on the DMX. Okay, so we're in single, let's have a look. Double, I like quad, okay, triple. Let's go up to quad, okay. So as you can see there, the, uh, the DMX is, um, is really, really simple to use. It's not as staggering as it looks when you look in the instruction manual. With the DMX though, it does flicker a little bit when you're on your fades and you get down the bottom. So um, that's pretty common with a lot of lights with DMX, even more expensive units. But I think you have to admit, for the price point, the DMX profiling is pretty good. All right, so here's a part of the video that a lot of you have requested. So you're looking to buy your first real decent RGB WW lights and the timpani and the nun light at the price point that you can afford. Which one do you buy? Well, I'm not gonna give you a definitive answer on that, but I will give you the pros and cons of each, and then you can best figure out what you need for your circumstance. Okay, so let's start off with the negatives of the Nan light or the pros of the timpani. Okay, so um, the Nan light, the uh, CCT mode, the white mode, is pretty ordinary for an RGBWW light. It is typically out by, on your CCT, it is typically out by 100 to 300 Kelvin, whereas the timpani is usually accurate to about 20 to 30 Kelvin. The next thing is the white point accuracy. This thing actually tracks the Planckian curve. It uses all of its color emitters to vector into a white point, whereas this unit is linear tracking as a bicolor unit, so it is usually pink. Now it does have a plus minus green to correct for that, but the plus minus green on this isn't calibrated, the numbers don't really seem to mean anything, and the plus minus green is not locked to the, um, to the white color emitters. Whereas the plus minus green on this is fully calibrated and locked in to the, um, to the white emitters. The next uh, disadvantage of this, I think, is the gels menu. The gels menu is rather pathetic, whereas the gels menu on the timpani has 147 Lee gels, and you can select your base color temperature, you can dial in your CCT, and then, and then put the gel on top. Now, in terms of the HSI mode, both of them have awesome HSI modes. 
Uh, the timpani though is the winner because you can select your base Kelvin at which you desaturate to. The timpani, you can also select your Kelvin in 50 Kelvin increments, whereas this unit you can only select in 100 Kelvin increments, and this unit only goes up to 7,500 Kelvin, whereas the timpani goes up to 10,000. Now let's talk about the advantages the Nanlite has. You can't really um, go past the fact that it's four times brighter. That is a staggering amount of brightness, four times brighter. And both of them have roughly the same beam angle, so it legitimately is four times brighter. It has the soft mode, okay, so that's, that's a huge plus. For me, this thing has better DMX. And the effects, both of them have great effects, but this one, I think, has the way better effects menu. All right, so let's get into the technical review. Um, I just want to explain the categories at which I break things down into first. Warm white, that's anything below 4,000 Kelvin. Mid whites, that's 4,000 to 5,000 Kelvin. And cool whites, that's 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin. So they're the categories that I break my data down into. All right, so let's have a look at CCT accuracies first. Now in uh, warm white, this unit in hard mode is typically accurate to plus or minus 102 Kelvin. And in its soft light setting, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 103 Kelvin. Now in the mid whites, in hard mode, it is typically out by an average of minus 127 Kelvin. However, in soft mode, that blows out to typically minus 255 Kelvin on average. In its cool whites, in hard mode, it is surprisingly accurate, typically out by minus 75 Kelvin only. However, in its soft light mode, it is typically out by minus 296 Kelvin. Now let's talk about the color rendering, and this light is incredibly consistent across its entire range. TLCI results first. The lowest score I came across anywhere was a 98, and the highest score I got was a 99. Now with TN30 color vector testing, the lowest score I got was a 94, and the highest score I got was a 95. That's pretty staggering when you consider that anything above 90 in a TN30 color vector test is really good. All right, let's take a look at our more common Kelvins, starting at 3,200 Kelvin first. In hard light mode, when I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,321, with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 97, and all CRI scores were above 90, with the exception of R12. TN30 color testing reveals a more accurate score would be 95% color rendition, with 103% saturation. The color spectrum looks quite healthy. And color mapping reveals that the white point is out by minus 0.0040 DUV, which would be close to a one quarter correction gel out. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin in soft light mode, I got 3,328 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 98. The CRI average was 97.2 and only R12 is below 90. TM30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 95% color rendition with 103% saturation. Color mapping reveals that the white point is below the Planckian curve by 0.0037 DUV, which when converted to gels would be somewhere between a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin in direct mode, I got 4,256 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 95.7. However, R9 and R12 are low. TN30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 94% color rendition with 104% saturation. Here is the wavelength analysis. And color mapping reveals that the white point is below the Planckian curve by a DUV score of minus 0.0057. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin in soft mode, I got 4,146 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score is 94.6. R9 and R12 are both low. R11 and R15 are just on 90%. TM30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 94% color rendition with 104% saturation. The light has a very healthy looking wavelength analysis. 
and color mapping reveals that the white point is out by a staggering minus 0.0070 DUV, which would be the equivalent of a one quarter and a one eighth gel combined. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin in hard light mode, I got 5,593 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 99. The average CRI score was 94.9 and both R9 and R12 were low. TN30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 94% color render with 104% saturation. The wavelength analysis looks good and color mapping reveals that the white point is below the Planckian curve by minus 0.0045 DUV, which would be roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin in soft light mode, I got 5,341 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 99. The average CRI score was 94 and the individual results are a very mixed bag. R9 is very low and R11, 12 and 15 are low. TN30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 94% color render with 105% saturation. Here is the waveform analysis. Color mapping reveals that the white point is below the Planckian curve with a DUV score of minus 0.0052 DUV, which would be roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. Now the last thing to talk about is color vectors and color saturations. So let's start off with our primary colors in full saturation. Red, which should be zero or 360 degrees, comes in at one degree. Green, which should be 120 degrees, comes in smack on at 120 degrees. Blue, which should be 240 degrees, comes smack on at 240 degrees. Now let's have a look at our secondary colors at full saturation. Yellow, which should be 60 degrees, comes in at 59 degrees. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, is 227 degrees. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 256 degrees. Now let's have a look at the secondary colors at 50% saturation. And one thing to point out here is this unit desaturates to 5,500 Kelvin. Red, which should be zero or 360 degrees, came in pretty close at 356 degrees with 30% saturation. Green, which should be 120 degrees, came in very close at 119 degrees, but with 24% saturation. Blue, which should be 240, was very, very close. 244 degrees with 66% saturation. Now let's have a look at our secondary colors at 50% saturation. Yellow, which should be 60, came in at 56 degrees with 28% saturation. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came in at 227 degrees with 45% saturation. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 259 with 54% saturation. Well, that's the review pretty much over. Thank you again to Protog, the distributor in Australia, for lending me this unit to have a look at. See you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.